Hello everybody, I'm Chris Morosky. The title of this video is Miscarriage, Spontaneous Abortion, and this video is part of our Reproductive Justice Conference series. The goals and objectives of this video are as follows. Distinguish the various types of spontaneous abortions. Counsel patients on the options for management of miscarriage. Compare and contrast the various methods for female sterilization and formulate an approach to assist patients with resources and management of family and sexual violence. So let's start off by learning a little bit about our patient, ZC. ZC is a 25-year-old Chinese G3P1011 at nine weeks by her last menstrual period who presents to your office for a first prenatal visit. This pregnancy was planned and is desired. She asks if she can find out the fetal sex today. The patient complains of off and on vaginal bleeding, which ranges from spotting to period-like bleeding over the past two days. What additional questions in history would you want to get from this patient? The additional questions in history you would want to get from this patient include the following. A complete history with focus on obstetrical and gynecological histories. And specific to her history of present illness, you would want to obtain the following. Further quantification of her vaginal bleeding, bowel and bladder symptoms, sexual history, and you want to ask her about risk factors for miscarriage and ectopic pregnancy. Let's see what pertinent positives we have for our patient ZC. In review of systems, she has no clots or heavy vaginal bleeding, no urinary symptoms, no GI symptoms, no fevers or chills. Her last intercourse was two weeks ago, and she's had no trauma. Her previous obstetrical history is one full-term cesarean delivery of a boy two years ago, and one pregnancy termination with dilation and suction curatage after finding out the sex was female. Her previous GYN history includes no abnormal pap smears, no STDs, and one male sexual partner who is her husband. Her previous surgical history includes a cesarean delivery and DNS for termination. She has no previous medical history and is taking no medications. She has no known drug allergies. She does smoke 10 cigarettes per day, but she drinks no alcohol and uses no drugs. She's a stay-at-home mother. The patient and her family immigrated from China two years ago. The patient speaks mostly Mandarin with limited English. She reports that she feels safe at home with her husband, although she says that he can be a little controlling at times. What physical exam would you perform? The physical exam that should be performed for this patient include the following. Vital signs and general appearance, a general skin exam, a heart and lung exam, an abdominal exam, and a pelvic exam to include inspection of the external genitalia, a speculum exam, a bimanual exam, and likely a rectal vaginal exam would not need to be performed for this patient. Here we present the physical exam for ZC. For vital signs, she's 5 feet 0 inches tall and 122 pounds. Her blood pressure is 124 over 86, heart rate 81, respiratory rate 16, and her temperature is 98.7 degrees Fahrenheit. On general appearance, she is alert, oriented, no apparent stress. Her skin exam reveals that her arms, chest, back, thighs, head, and neck are without bruising or laceration. Her cardiovascular exam is a regular rate and rhythm with a normal S1 and S2. Her lungs are clear to auscultation bilaterally. Her abdomen is soft, non-tender, non-distended. There is no guarding or rebound. On pelvic exam, she has normal female external genitalia, normal vagina, and open cervix on speculum exam. She has minimal blood in the vagina. On bimanual exam, her cervix is one centimeter dilated. She has no cervical motion tenderness, no adnexal masses or tenderness, and her uterus is approximately 10 week size. What additional labs and testing would you order? The additional labs and testing that you should order for this patient include a complete blood count, a type and screen, a serum quantitative HCG level, and a transvaginal ultrasound of the pelvis. The purpose of these things is to, again, quantify her blood loss, determine if she's RH negative, it would require a Rogam shot because she is having bleeding, and you would want to know the serum HCG level to correlate with the findings on the transvaginal ultrasound of the pelvis to determine if you should be able to see an intrude in pregnancy or not. The purpose of the vaginal ultrasound would be to determine viability and location of the pregnancy and also to document the number of gestations. So before we go on and discuss the findings of the ultrasound and blood work for patient ZC, I wanted to quickly review the types of spontaneous abortion. This shows up a lot in your shelf exam and clinically this is very relevant. There are various different types of spontaneous abortion, 
and how we determine them clinically is based on three things. The first is whether or not the cervix is open or closed. The second is whether or not there are products of conception still remaining within the uterus. And the third is if there is a fetal heartbeat present. So taking them line by line, a complete abortion occurs after the patient has completely miscarried and passed all of the pregnancy tissue. She is mostly recovered. Her cervix would be closed, the products of conception would be absent from the uterus on ultrasound, and there would be no fetal heartbeat. An incomplete abortion is when the miscarriage process is occurring, but all of the products of conception have not yet been passed. With this, the cervix would be open, the products of conception would still be present partially within the uterus, and there would be no fetal heartbeat. In a missed abortion, the cervix is closed, the products of conception remain normally within inside the uterus, and there is an absent fetal heartbeat. Essentially, the patient has no cramping or bleeding, despite the fact that the pregnancy is no longer viable. With the threatened abortion, the cervix is closed, the products of conception are present within the uterus, and the fetal heartbeat is also present. This is a very common presentation to the emergency room, and fortunately, we are able to reassure patients in that 80% of threatened abortion miscarriages go on to be a normal pregnancy when identified after eight weeks. An inevitable abortion is a pretty rare finding, um, but it does show up sometimes on shelf exams, even though clinically we use this a little less often. With an inevitable abortion, the cervix is open, the products of conception are present within the uterus, and there is a fetal heartbeat present, but we do know that due to the dilation of the cervix, inevitably the pregnancy will be lost. Finally, with a septic abortion, you can have this really with any of the other types of abortion, it's just that there's gonna be SERS criteria present. The patient will have tenderness, fever, foul-smelling vaginal discharge, an elevated white count, and as she gets sicker and sicker, she may be hypotensive and tachycardic. It is important to identify a septic abortion because this is treated differently than any of the other managements of abortion because these patients really do need IV antibiotics and they must be managed surgically. Okay, with an understanding of the types of abortions, let's move on and see what happened with our patient ZC. Her transvaginal pelvic ultrasound reveals a singleton intrauterine pregnancy at eight weeks and six days by crown rump length. There is no fetal cardiac activity. There is a yolk sac that is present. She has normal appearing bilateral fallopian tubes and ovaries. There is no ectopic pregnancy present, and she has no pelvic free fluid. Her beta HCG level is 2,736. Her blood type is B positive. Her hemoglobin is 11.8, and her hematocrit is 33.4%. What options do you discuss with her? In terms of the management of spontaneous abortion, there are really three different options. The first option is expectant management. Expectant management allows the patient the time for her body to normally begin the process of miscarriage. This usually is discussed with patients who are diagnosed with a missed abortion. We do know that there is some amount of time from the diagnosis to the actual passing of pregnancy with missed abortion, and most studies document this up to almost 30 days. With expectant management, I prefer to see patients back in the office weekly or at least talk to them on the phone weekly if they haven't begun to miscarry. I like to stay in touch so I can continue to offer support and to discuss the other management options in case they have further questions or have perhaps changed their mind. The next management option is medical management. This usually includes the use of mesoprostol. There are a lot of different ways to provide mesoprostol to patients who want to medically manage their miscarriage. The most common route is 800 micrograms placed vaginally, and the patient may repeat this dose no sooner than eight hours after the first dose and up to seven days later. There is new evidence now to include mifeprostone in the medical management of missed abortion. If available, the patient can take 200 milligrams of mifeprostone orally 24 hours prior to taking her mesoprostone. The final option to be discussed with the patient is surgical management, and this includes dilation and suction curatage, in the first trimester, and a procedure which is similar but requires different equipment called a dilation and evacuation in the second trimester. The risk benefits and alternatives of all of these different management options should be discussed with the patient at the time of diagnosing her miscarriage. Okay, so let's go on and see the follow-up for our patient ZC. ZC is relieved to discover that this is a miscarriage. She decides on medical management of her miscarriage. After further questioning, you discover that her husband only wants another boy. He has threatened to leave her and return to China with their son if she were to get pregnant and deliver a girl. 
This is why she had her last abortion. When following up this case, it's important for us to talk briefly about family, intimate partner, and sexual violence. There's not enough time in this video to completely cover this subject, but it is important to touch on it here. Medical students, residents, and physicians do not need to consider themselves to be expert in this subject. We don't really have the background and the training for that with what we learn in medical school. But it's very important that we all screen and ask about this. It is unfortunately very common. What we do know is that maternal homicide kills more women in the United States each year than hemorrhage, embolism, and preeclampsia and eclampsia combined. What you should be familiar with is the ability to call for help and contact your social worker. Social workers are trained in this and they're a great way to provide the patient with support and resources. In the setting where you don't have immediate access to a social worker, you can also use the internet to your advantage. So Google this. I did this here for this video and I wanna share some resources that are available in the Connecticut for women here. Obviously this video is broadcast in other locations and you want to look into your resources that are available to you more closely. The first resource is the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence. It can be found at ctcadv.org um, or connecticutsafeconnect.org and their 1-800 number is displayed right here. Here's a screenshot of their website and this is an excellent resource for patients in terms of intimate partner or family violence. There's also plenty of links to other local resources for patients in the state of Connecticut. 211 is a publicly funded resource for many different questions in Connecticut, but also is a huge resource for domestic violence and partner abuse. Their website specifically focusing on this issue is displayed here. As you can see, not only do they have a lot of information, but there's also a link to a map where resources and shelters can be found throughout Connecticut, which includes their location, as well as contact information, and the hours that they're open. There's also the Connecticut Alliance to End Sexual Violence. This is a very similar type of website to the 211 Connecticut in that there's great information here and there's also all of the different membership organizations that are listed throughout the state. These provide again contact information, locations, and hours of business and there is a lot of information here for patients experiencing sexual violence. I do encourage you to take some time to become familiar with the resources in your area around domestic and sexual violence. Okay, finally moving on to contraception. Your patient takes vaginal mesoprostol for the medical management of her miscarriage. She miscarries the pregnancy without complication. She does not want to become pregnant. She wishes to discuss female sterilization procedures. What methods are available to her? And what other important topics should you discuss related to permanent sterilization? When discussing female sterilization, this really gets divided up into two types of sterilization. One type is postpartum sterilization, which occurs right immediately during a cesarean section or the next day or so following a vaginal delivery. Then there's interval sterilization, which occurs in between pregnancies. Since ZC had an early miscarriage, postpartum sterilization would not be appropriate for her. However, there are various techniques for postpartum sterilization. These do sometimes show up on your shelf exam, and we like to ask about these a lot when you're on the clerkship rotation. So knowing the difference between the Pomeroy and Parkland, which were the two most common procedures that we performed, is really important. But this long list of Irving, Madliner, Aldridge, Oxford, Uchida, Kroner, they're all really, if you wanted to like kind of nerd out about this, and if you do really want to read about these, you can find them at this website, www.glowm.com, which is the Global Library of Women's Medicine. You can search postpartum sterilization, it's right there, and it's actually a really good read. In terms of interval sterilization, this is what would be appropriate for ZC if she chose this. This is done now through laparoscopy. The fallopian tubes can either have clips or bands applied, fulguration or burning with the electrosurgery can be performed, or the fallopian tubes can be removed, which is self-injectomy. In the past, we used to offer patients hysteroscopic sterilization by placing small coils inside the openings of the fallopian tubes. This has since been removed from the market and is not available to patients at this time. I didn't want to include all of the different types of sterilization in video format, but these two videos actually are really well done, and they are good examples of the fallope ring and the filchy clip. This first video is a great example of placement of the fallope ring on the fallopian tubes.
And in this second video, this is a very good example of placement of Filchy clips on the fallopian tubes for sterilization. Lastly, in having this discussion with ZC about sterilization, it is important to discuss these other considerations. The first topic is regret. Patients do sometimes regret sterilization and hope to have childbearing in the future. People's lives change and they may still want to have children based on the changes in their lives. Sterilization should be considered a permanent and unreversible procedure. And we do know that women who have their tubes tied at a younger age are more likely to have regret. Another important topic to discuss is coercion. Our country unfortunately has a history of coercing patients into receiving sterilization in order to obtain health care. But there are lots of other situations in women's lives, other family members, friends, employers, and the such that can coerce them into having a tubal ligation. And it is very important for the provider to make sure that the patient is not under undue coercion in terms of making this decision to have her tubes tied. Another topic that's also very important to discuss with patients is the various reliable reversible contraceptive options. These include IUDs and implants, which do have success rates very similar to permanent sterilization procedures. However, they remain reversible. Obviously, these methods have separate side effects. However, these need to be balanced out with the permanency of sterilization. For patients with state-funded health care insurance, they also need to sign a state-mandated consent form. This consent form names three important things, that the patient is at least 21 years old, that she understands permanent sterilization is permanent and there are reversible options available to her, and that none of her health care rights will be taken away if she changes her mind, even if that gets done up to the moment of her surgery. Finally, when discussing surgical sterilization procedures, it's important to keep in mind vulnerable populations. These would include women with the power of attorney to make their medical decision making, women with severe mental illness, and prisoners. ZC does not necessarily fall under these vulnerable population, but one would have to pause and directly address with her the concern that her miscarriage might not be the best time to be making this decision. She is also young and may have regret. All that being said, with a shared decision-making model, it's important to keep in mind that women really are the best decision makers for their own lives and their own health care decision, and with good counseling, she would be able to make the decision that is appropriate for her. All right, everybody, that's the end of this video. Let's look at our goals and objectives, and we can see that I think we accomplished them pretty well. We're able to distinguish now the various types of spontaneous abortions. We were able to counsel patients on the options for management of miscarriage. We are able to compare and contrast the various methods for female sterilization. And finally, we are able to formulate an approach to assist patients with resources and management for family and sexual violence. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks so much for watching. Good luck with all of your studies. We'll see you for the next one. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.